All right, friends, welcome to the next episode here of Red Delta Project Podcast, live feed Q&A, helping you to be fit and live free by taking a fundamental approach to diet and exercise. As always, I'm Matt Chifferly from the Red Delta Project. Today's episode is a follow-up from last week's. Last week's episode was all about satisfying the four fundamental appetites of a healthy diet, healthy eating, in other words. And this week's topic is about the approach that we use here called calorie hacking. Now, there's a very good reason why I have the two things separate, because usually in our fitness culture, healthy eating and diet and nutrition is kind of synonymous with uh, weight management and weight control. And over the years, I've learned that it is a lot easier and a lot more effective to both have a healthy diet and manage your weight if you keep the two as completely separate topics and subjects to completely different goals. Because when we try to have a healthy diet and manage our weight at the same time, the two can often conflict with one another. That in the, pro, in the pursuit of a healthy diet, that your ability to manage weight gets compromised. And the more we try to lose weight or to uh, have a weight loss approach to diet, the more the healthiness of the diet gets compromised. And so you kind of end up with this tug of war back and forth. And no matter what you do, you're losing because both losing weight and trying to keep a healthy diet can be stressful when they're in competing interest to one another. So check out the episode that I covered last week of what a real healthy diet is, because a healthy diet is not about weight control. A healthy diet is not about helping you lose weight. It can help you lose weight because one of the biggest reasons why people overeat and gain a lot of body fat is because they have chronically unfed or an unsatisfied appetites. Those four appetites is the satisfaction of hunger, satisfaction of nutritional support, satisfaction of metabolic support, and the satisfaction of hedonic support, the pleasure and the enjoyments of food. And typically, we're told in our fitness culture that if you want to satisfy one, you have to starve another. And that's not how a healthy diet actually works, because the more balanced and uh, holistic your diet is, the more you're going to satisfy all four without chronically overfeeding yourself. So check out that episode. I'll try and remember to put a link down below in the show notes. But when it comes to people trying to lose weight, especially if I know they've got a history of dieting and a history of yo-yo dieting and uh, dysfunctional relationships with food and things like that, which is also very much a staple of chronic uh, you know, dieting, which is dieting often goes hand in hand with overeating, which I know sounds a little bit weird, but that's actually what usually happens. Some of the biggest overeaters I ever know are also chronic dieters. And most of the people who don't overeat are not ever following any particular kind of diet. But when we are looking to try to manage our weight, if our weight feels like it's all over the place and it's like I gained 10 pounds of fat and I lost 10 pounds of fat, usually that's a sign that we don't have a very healthy approach to diet and food to begin with. So I usually recommend to people at first, like, don't worry too much about the weight thing. I know it sounds weird and it's a hard thing to do because it's like, all I want, I just want to lose the weight. I just want to get rid of the beer belly. It's like, I know, I know that's what you want, but take care of the healthiness of your diet first. It's kind of like if you came to me and you were like, I want to run a marathon. So what kind of shoes should I be wearing and what kind of training program and what kind of hydration schedule and what kind of this and that should I be using? Should I run cross country? How about shorter miles during the week and longer miles during the week? Like, dude, why are you asking me this question? You have a broken leg. Like none of this matters until your leg heals. You can't do anything until your leg heals. So don't worry about that stuff just yet. It's the same thing with weight management. When we have an unhealthy di uh, approach to diet, we are not going to be in the best shape in order to make something happen for fat loss. So anyway, go check out that episode again down below and everything is um, it's uh, something that's going to be uh, more beneficial to you to get the whole healthiness of the diet taken care of first. And the second point I want to make before jumping into it too much is, you know, I always like to give this attitude to anybody who's trying to lose weight because there's a lot in our fitness culture that promotes this idea that, you know, weight management or trying to lose weight is kind of like this chronically ongoing thing that it's normal to struggle with one's weight that uh, there are people out there who for years have been going on diets and they're always trying to lose weight and they're always trying to manage their weight and 
this is not something that is conducive to health and wellness and performance and even weight management. That one of the most important things that you can do for your health of mind, body, and lifestyle is to, quote, get the whole weight thing just done and taken care of so you don't have to worry about it anymore. And I know a lot of people think, well, yeah, once I lose the weight, then I'm going to be set and ready. And that's not at all the case because some of the people I've met in my life who are the most obsessed with managing their weight are the ones who have the seemingly ideal body that just losing the weight doesn't necessarily mean you're going to have the whole weight issue solved. In fact, a lot of people who obsess over diet and are chronically stressed about food and stressed out about working out and burning them out uh, the enough calories and stuff are the ones who seemingly don't need to lose weight. Uh, you know, that was certainly my case for many years, my obsessive compulsive exercise habits, my dysfunctional eating habits and stuff. Spent years doing this sort of thing. And I know we often associate struggling with losing weight or trying to manage weight as something that is the curse of people who are overweight, but it affects everybody equally. You don't escape that prison of weight management uh, and all the dysfunctional ways that go along with it just because you're lean. Leanness is, has no safety or shielding against those sorts of things. You can be just as much obsessed about calorie counting and having it ruin your uh, burger or your um, trip to a restaurant, regardless of whether or not you're overweight or underweight or have the perfect body, because it's an approach, it's an attitude towards food. And one of the best things you can do for your health of mind, body, and lifestyle is to get to a point in a place with food and with weight where you're just like, it's taken care of. I don't have to worry about it anymore because working out is a lot easier when you don't care how many calories you're burning in a workout. Eating and eating for health is a lot easier when you're not reading labels or weighing your food. I'm like, I don't care how many calories are in that. I don't care how much fat or sugar is in something. It's not important to me in the slightest because I don't need to worry about that stuff in order to manage my weight. And that's why calorie hacking can be such a good way to couple on top of a healthy eating strategy of eating the satisfy that I covered last week. Because if you want to be strong and healthy and fit and get the most out of your workouts and your lifestyle and be healthy and stuff, one of the best things you can ever do is get the whole weight management thing done, taken care of. You don't have to worry about it anymore. Because that's certainly the place I'm at right now. I don't count calories. I don't weigh myself. I don't give a damn how many calories I burn on a mountain bike ride. That's not why I'm on a mountain bike ride. I'm biking to bike. I'm not doing it to burn calories. I don't have to worry about managing my weight or my body fat levels at all. It's like the furthest thing from my mind. And believe me, life is a hell of a lot better that way. <laughs> it is way better. My workouts are a lot better. My eating is a lot better. Everything about my health and wellness and my quality of life is a lot better. So this message out there in our fitness culture that it's supposed to be this ongoing lifelong ordeal, that's not true. Most of the people who are not struggling with their weight are not doing that, those sorts of things. Like, I don't give a damn what the latest diets are. I don't need to. It's simply not important to me anymore. And it's great. It's a very good way of approaching things. And that's my kind of, I mean, it's certainly not something we're going to accomplish just today. It's a process. It's something that takes time. But I hope today we'll kind of give you a little bit of a, a footnote into it or a foothold into it, uh, coupled with what I covered last week. Let me get to some questions here. Super Prime is saying, uh, is BOSU ball training effective way to train balance and stability to avoid getting knocked over for fighters or for football players? And what you think uh, are other ways to train balance and stability uh, outside of BOSU? So I'm one of those coaches and trainers that's not a big fan of using unstable surfaces uh, because one, the majority of the stability that we need to cultivate is more proximal in the body than distal. And by that, I mean, it's more central to your torso. The majority of stability you need to develop is in your shoulders and in your hips, especially on firm ground. And when we utilize unstable objects like BOSU balls and balance discs and AirX pads, what you're doing is you're transferring the need for stability to be much more on the distal points of the body, like the wrists and your ankles. And sometimes that has its applications. I used to train a guy on balance discs all the time 
because the sports that he was playing required a lot of that ankle stability, uh, particularly like water skiing and things like that. And of course, we certainly address things in the hips. But if you have a lot of ankle stability, but you're not addressing your hip stability, you can stand on BOSU balls all day long and do every exercise on a BOSU. It's not really going to do anything. Uh, it's one of those cases where standing and training on a BOSU ball really does improve your balance and stability for standing on a BOSU ball. So if your goal is to be really good at using a BOSU ball, it's great. But in the case of stability for things like fighting and for football and stuff, I really don't believe it's a worthwhile use of your time. I, I never use the BOSU ball myself for anything, for any of my clients. We just don't use it. I just don't think it's very effective for that sort of thing. But I've got clients standing on one leg all the time. I got clients doing, you know, T planks and shoulder drills and crawling and stuff that helps with that shoulder stability. I do that every single class with every single client because that's where the real stability is developed. So if you want the stability, check out some of the stability and shifting exercises that I have on the YouTube channel. Grind style calisthenics, we have shift work in our warm up specifically for that purpose to develop that type of stability. And you know, you don't need any special fancy equipment you know, for that sort of development. And the stronger your hips get, the more strong and stable your shoulders are, particularly in your, your shoulder blade movement, the more your stability you're going to have. And yeah, you're still going to feel unstable if you step on a BOSU ball, but so what, you know, you're not training to be strong on a BOSU ball unless you are. Matt C is coming on saying, Matt, what do you think uh, is stronger, uh, Mihawk or Shanks? I have no idea. I don't follow too many people, folks. Uh, so I, I would say flip a coin and it's always stronger at what too, you know, I, I bet Shanks is a lot stronger at juggling flaming kettlebells there. That's, that's my opinion. <laughs> um, Tall Waters is asking, what's the biggest regret you have in training for uh, handstand pushups? Uh, not a whole lot of regrets, but I would say one of the biggest things that I know other people have regretted is just progressing it way too fast. This is a big common lament that I find with people is they're like, okay, how do I get into a handstand real quick? And then they're trying to do handstand pushups and they're not spending nearly enough time with hand stability exercises, shoulder stability exercises, like the crow pose and stuff in yoga, or just building up the general strength in their shoulders and triceps with things like pike pushups or elevated uh, supported handstand pushups, like when your feet are up on a box or something. Uh, it's my sincere opinion that when it comes to vertical motions like handstand work and for pull-ups, most people are overloading themselves. They're working with far too much resistance. They don't have the stability. They don't have the strength. They don't have the coordination or the tension control. And as a result, they get injured a lot easier and they just don't make the progress they want because they haven't built up that foundation. So take things real nice and slow. In fact, I would say, give yourself this challenge. Try giving yourself nothing but pike push-ups and crow stands or frog stands for the next two months. Don't even try to do a handstand of any kind and really progress those to a high degree to build up that strength. Then come back to it and just watch how much better your handstands have become. Matt C saying, Meow Checks are characters from the fictional literature One Piece. Cool. I'll have to check it out. Thank you very much for letting me know. Uh, I'm always looking for more things to read. Uh, I'm not too uh, up on a lot of pop culture things these days. So let's dive into calorie hacking. First off, what is it? <laughs> what in the world is calorie hacking? Well, calorie hacking is a very different approach to weight management than what is chronically out there uh, or very popular. So this is how weight management usually happens with folks where they look in the mirror and they see the scale or a picture of themselves and they're like, oh my, I need to lose weight. Okay, I'm going to get on this diet. And it doesn't matter what the diet is. They're all the same thing anyway. And it's like, what kind of diet should I follow? It doesn't matter. They're all fundamentally the same. So let's say you're going to you know, take on a low carb, low sugar kind of diet. Okay, fine. Whatever. It doesn't matter anyway. But you get on it. And initially, you're like, oh my gosh, this thing that they're saying I can't eat anymore, like sugar or something, it's in everything. Well, yes, of course it is. That's how these things work. They need to take some sort of food or ingredient that's very popular and restrict you as much as possible. It's just a fancy way of getting you to eat less. They're not going to tell you to avoid blue food coloring because it's not very popular. So it wouldn't really create that much of a limitation. So you're having this 
series, this initial period where you're like, okay, I've got to limit this thing. So can't have my Starbucks coffee because of sugar in it. I can't have soda. I can't have junk food. I can't have these processed foods. I can't have all this stuff. Okay. So this is the initial phase of a typical diet where you are restricting. You're like, gosh, what can I eat? Oh, there's not a whole lot I can eat. It's uh, basically, you know, whole foods, natural foods, things that are uh, very nutrient dense and okay, that's the stuff I can eat. And because of the restriction, you're eating a lot less, you start losing weight and you think, hey, it's working. Not yet it hasn't, but you think it is. You think it's working because you're losing weight and that's your actual objective. But in the eyes of mother nature, weight loss is never the objective to a change in your diet. The purpose, the fundamental purpose of any dietary change you ever make is never to make you lose weight. It's for something else that I'll share with you in a minute. But you're losing weight right now as you're learning the ropes of the diet. And this is, feels like it's working. This is the honeymoon period. You also may start to be feeling better because, of course, you're eating more nutrient-dense foods. So you're having better support of your nutritional support. Maybe you're also improving your metabolic support. So your energy level is going up. It's all like, this is fantastic. This is the best thing ever. And this is when you become a bit of an evangelist for the diet. You're talking about it on social media and you can't shut up about it at work and you're driving your coworkers crazy and stuff and everything seems hunky-dory. But after a certain period of time, you know, it could be several weeks, could be even several months, things start to not be so rosy anymore. You know, the needle on the scale isn't going down anymore. What the heck is going on? You also start to notice that you're having these cravings and that uh, what you originally, it was like, well, I didn't really miss giving up some of those sugary or carb laden or fat laden or whatever foods, but boy, now I could really kill for, you know, a, a cold glass of lemonade now that it's really hot outside. And why am I craving bread all of a sudden? This is the crazy, I never wanted bread before. So all of these changes and adaptations are happening. Plus you're finding ways to get around the loopholes of the diet. Like, you know, I never noticed those, you know, keto ice cream bars at Costco before, but hey, now that I'm on this keto thing and there's ice cream bars there, no, let me go online and find out how do you get keto candy bars? And oh, there's that restaurant down the street that makes the keto falafel and all these other things that I didn't notice before, but now you're having all these adaptations and changes in your dietary patterns and your habits, and you start to get around that limitation. You're finding ways to get around it. So naturally, if you're getting around that limitation, you're eating more again. You're still following the rules of the diet, but you're finding ways to uh, enjoy, have your cake and eat it too, so to speak. As long as it's keto or low carb or whatever, then you're still on your diet, but you're not eating much less to begin with. Plus, your body's changing. You're noticing that how you feel after eating certain foods is changing a little bit. How foods taste is starting to change, your physical reaction, and this is natural. Because when we make a big change in our diet to any degree, again, as I said, your body's goal is not to lose weight. Your body's goal is to prevent you from losing weight. And this is because the ultimate goal of any adaptation or changes that we make with diet and exercise is to bring the body back into a balanced homeostatic state. Because when you're in a homeostatic state and you're in a state of balance, you get to do fun things like survive <laughs> and not die because that's ultimately what your body thinks is going on. Whenever you bring on any type of limitations in your diet, especially if they're fairly severe, again, it doesn't matter what the limitation is, your body effectively thinks that, oh my gosh, we don't have these foodstuffs in our environment anymore. Uh, we just don't have this type of food, so we've got to find a way to keep surviving and adapt to this new environment that doesn't have that food and has more of this type of food. So we go through all kinds of changes changes from our gut bacteria, our digestive, not the process, but how well we digest various foods, the nutrients we can extract from various foods. There is a lot of various adaptations that we go through. And we have the social adaptations and our habitual adaptations. And all this stuff is happening during this honeymoon period when the diet is, quote, working. So all that adds up to bringing you back into a homeostatic state where you are no longer at threat of starving to death, which is good. Uh, but because you're now in more of a static homeostatic state, you're no longer in that negative calorie balance. And so you stop losing weight, even though you're still sticking to the diet. So this is when people come to me and they're like, what went wrong? Why isn't the diet working? When in fact, it absolutely is working. 
it worked 100% of the time. It's working extremely well because the ultimate goal of the adaptations of a diet is to stop you from losing weight because your body likes to survive, not lose weight. Your body doesn't care about six pack abs or getting beach ready. It just wants you to be adequately fed. So when you change up your diet to a de large degree, you're effectively telling your body we're in a different food environment, change so we can stay adequately fed in this new environment. And then nothing happens. <laughs> You've stopped losing weight, only now you're kind of screwed because you have taught your body how to be in more of a homeostatic state at this lower calorie intake or with this different limited, uh, limitation of food. And so you've made it a lot easier to overeat going back to your normal diet. You've made it easier to overeat if you have a binge or you have included these other foods into your diet. You know, when low carb was a really big thing back in the day, a lot of clients and friends who were very much on the Atkins and low, low fat and everything, or low carb, excuse me, and they were like, oh my gosh, I had half a bagel the other day. I was at a breakfast uh, function or something. I had just had half a bagel and I felt terrible. And I got a headache and it didn't make me feel very good and I felt sluggish and everything. And me mistakenly think, well, that means that the bagel wasn't good for me because that's how it always made me feel. No, <laughs> it's because you've essentially deconditioned yourself from the ability to handle a bagel or that kind of food. You've made yourself out of shape, in other words, to handle that type of food. So you just overloaded yourself with half a bagel, whereas before you could handle it just fine. It's exactly the same thing as if you are a uh, seasoned exercise veteran and then you just take on a sedentary lifestyle for several weeks and then you go back into the gym and all you do is like a few sets of push-ups and the next day you're sore as hell. I'm like, what the heck happened? It's like, yeah, you're out of shape. <laughs> you, you got out of homeostasis from being able to handle that. And it's the same exact thing with diet. So this is how a conventional approach to diet ultimately prevents you from losing weight. It teaches your body, stop losing weight. Don't lose it anymore. And the more times you do this, the faster your body learns this. It happens all the time with uh, like bodybuilders, figure competitors, people who need to get super lean. The first time they're dieting down for a show, they effectively can make it happen. And they're like, okay, this worked. But then they do another show like a year or so later. They're like, oh my gosh, I did the same diet. And instead of losing weight and getting leaner for six weeks or three months or whatever, I only lost weight for about four weeks. And then it just automatically stopped. It's like, yeah, because your body's like, oh, this thing again. Okay, great. I know how to handle this. I know how to adapt a lot faster because your body sees that as the goal. Your body doesn't know you're trying to step on stage. All your body thinks is, I need to get back to homeostasis, a state of unchanging balance as quickly as possible. And it becomes better at doing that the more you do it. And this is why a lot of chronic dieters or on and off again dieters have so much trouble trying to lose the weight. Sian Doridia. I hope I'm pronouncing Doridia. Hopefully I'm pronouncing that right. When it comes to power tempo training, yes, very good. Uh, can we do them with a little bit of bounce or rebound, right? This is a common question. I should address this in another video. I'm just using a stretch load reflex, right? And as I've mentioned before, we don't want that stretch re load reflex uh, because that's what plyometrics uses and stuff like that. And the whole idea with power training or power tempo training is we want the muscle to generate a lot of tension very quickly uh, in a high degree of tension. That's really the objective. It's not so much how fast you're developing or how fast you're moving. We're just trying to get the muscle to hold more tension. And if we're getting movement and power from other sources, like the stretch and load reflex and stuff, we're kind of negating the need for all of that tension in the muscle. So, and I know it seems similar because we're moving quickly, but the goal is not to move quickly. The goal is to generate a lot of tension. It's not really about how fast can you move. Sometimes when people are doing power tempo training, they're not really moving that quick. And they're like, but I'm not moving fast. I'm like, it doesn't matter. We're not here to move quickly. We're here to generate a lot of tension. And if you're bouncing out of things, then you're effectively being able to generate that power, that speed without generating as much tension. So it's a shortcut in the wrong direction, in other words. Okay. Other questions here. Yes, uh, Hypno uh, is saying your brain will also change 
due to the environment. Yeah, there's all sorts of adaptations going on. You know, our body has so many systems and we're only just now really starting to understand this sort of thing. That when we change, especially things about our diet, we have a huge systematic adaptations that go on throughout our entire body. And always remember that the purpose behind that adaptation is to get you back to homeostasis. That is the goal. When you have a big change in your diet, especially some sort of a chronic restriction, your body is like, okay, we've got to change and adapt to get back to homeostasis. That is our priority. That is not our number one goal. It is our only goal right now. Because as I was mentioning before, until you get to a survivable state, nothing else matters. Your body will not allow much else to happen, depending on the severity of it. So that's why this process that always happens with any type of diet, you can't avoid it, is what we not necessarily want to avoid, but we just want to uh, use things to our advantage. Because when we have a change in our dietary approach, we do quote, lose weight and we have this adaptation period, but it's always supposed to be temporary. It's supposed to be short term. And so what calorie hacking does is it makes use of that short term adaptation period when we're losing the weight and saying, let's just do that and then permanent and then prematurely end the approach. So our body doesn't quite, well, you know, get used to the new diet. It's just a state where it's like, okay, I'm losing weight. I've got to find a way to get back to homeostasis because we're not eating all this food anymore. And we're really, really, oh, never mind. We're back to a square one. Oh, okay. Okay. We're good. So that way you're effectively taking a short term approach to the diet where you're using a hack where you are either significantly reducing the amount of calories you're eating, or sometimes a, a hack can be in a significant increase in your caloric expenditure. And when you're doing that, you're forcing yourself you know, out of that calorie balance, but it's only for a short term. It can be as short as a couple of days. Some people will do it for a week or two. And then you perm and you purposely, I keep wanting to say permanently, you purposely get back into a homeostatic state on your own terms by bringing your diet back up a little bit more, having your diet be a little bit more balanced. You bring some of those foods back in. And so you are purposely coming back to homeostasis on your own terms. You're not being forced into it through your physiological adaptations against your will because you're going back to homeostasis whether you like it or not. So you might as well do it on your own terms. So that way, not only is it a lot easier and less stressful because the more your body is out of homeostasis, the more stressful it is on mind, body, and lifestyle. But it's also just you learning how to control your caloric balance on purpose. So that way you're learning how to both lose weight and control weight because that's a big part of this whole weight control thing is people can lose 10 pounds. Most people can lose 10 pounds fairly easily, but keeping it off is the hard part. That's the thing that a lot of people struggle with. I know people out there are like, yeah, I've lost 90 pounds. Really, you have? Yeah, I just keep losing and regaining the same 10, 15 pounds every time I try to lose weight. It adds up to 90 pounds. So when we purposely go back into homeostasis, you are effectively teaching yourself how to get back into a balanced state. And you don't keep ping-ponging back and forth between caloric negative calorie balance to positive, negative to positive, negative, and your weights fluctuate in yo-yoing all the time. And that's why calorie balance can work or uh, calorie hacking can work is it teaches you control and it gives you the ability to purposely lose weight in opportune moments because it's hard. And trying to lose weight is, is a hard thing to do. It's hard on mind, body, and lifestyle. It's a stressful thing. So you can pick and choose the opportunities in your life. If you've got a lot of stress at work and you're going crazy and you just can't meal prep and everything's going nuts, well, you don't do it then. You know, you, you're just trying to eat healthy in that state. Don't try to lose weight at that point. But when things are getting a little bit easier and you've got time on your hands and you can meal prep and you're motivated to start taking a crack at losing, you know, three to five pounds, that's when you can start employing calorie hacking because it's easier in that case. Leroy, the man is saying, hey, Matt, uh, you're right about fitness dogmas yesterday. Uh, went to a commercial gym, did 80 kilogram. Uh, good morning with accurate uh, accessory work. Guy giving me advice. 
how I'm breaking my back, but I gradually work my way up to this. Yeah, exactly. Everybody's coming with their advices from their own perspective. The good morning is not my favorite. I'll agree with him on that one. Uh, just because when it comes to a hip hinged movement, uh, I've always much preferred like the Romanian deadlift just because it gives you a way out. You know, if you're down there and you're starting to get pretty fatigued, then you can just drop the bar or you can bend your knees and turn it into a conventional deadlift. You have a way out. Good mornings don't do that. Uh, they basically force you into a position that you better come out from. <laughs> and uh, that the other thing too is, you know, I'm just a, I've always been a big Bruce Lee fan and that's how he hurt his back and suffered from back issues for his most of his adult life is he uh, injured it during good mornings. But you're right, like any exercise can be safe or dangerous depending on the role of the practitioner. You know, don't ever blame the exercise for an injury. You know, I used to have terrible knees because of lunges, terrible shoulders because of dips and a terrible back uh, because, of, or terrible elbows rather, because of pull-ups. But you know how I hurt, how I cured my knees? Lunges. You know how I saved my shoulders? Dips. You know how I saved my elbows? Pull-ups. Because I learned what I was doing wrong in those exercises. And then once I fixed those things, those exercises healed the very things that they were causing. So that's a little bit of a rant on my part. But yeah, we usually blame exercises for being a good or a bad thing for us. When in reality, it's the practitioner. Oh, I already addressed that one. Excuse me. Excuse me. Peter uh, James, same. Does it have the same effect when you're trying to gain weight? Because it can be difficult too. Yeah, so when we're gaining weight, uh, oftentimes that can be a little bit on the easier side, uh, especially when my recommendations are usually just have more calorically dense food as part of your normal diet. You know, It's hard to gain weight when you're, quote, eating healthy. And I use that in air quotes because most of us equate eating healthy with dieting. I eat healthy, I don't eat carbs. I eat healthy, I don't eat meat. I eat healthy, I don't eat sugar. That does not make a healthy diet, my friends. You're not going to be healthy because you don't eat processed foods. That's a very limited approach. It's a very uh, short-sighted approach. There's a heck of a lot more you need to do to be healthy than just not eat certain food. And when we base the healthiness of our diet on not eating something, all you're doing is setting yourself up for a massive limitation to your health and your weight and everything else. But when we have such limitations, it also just makes it harder to gain weight. So the first step I always give people when they're struggling to gain weight is don't diet of any kind, unless you have to, religious reasons, medical reasons, things like that. But if you don't have to be on a diet, don't do it. There's no good reason to. Uh, second is let some higher calorie foods in the diet. You know, the, the cheeseburgers, the pizza, and things like that, just to, I call it caloric fortification. Ben and Jerry's ice cream is great for that. <laughs> Peanut butter and jelly sandwiches, really helpful for that sort of thing. Uh, that can be a good way to just get some extra calories in. But outside of that, yeah, you know, calorie hacking can go in the opposite direction. Eat a lot more, especially if you're hungry too. I, whenever I've been gaining weight uh, throughout my life, I've always noticed it's come in spurts. It's not been a chronic thing. For a couple of months, I'll just eat like, you know, a bread truck, like the, the food's going out of style and I'll gain some weight, but it's usually also coupled with a, a much heavier training schedule. For whatever reason, I'm just really crushing the workouts. Right now, these days, I'm not really hitting very hard, heavy workouts. I just don't have the time. I don't have the energy. I don't have the motivation to do that. So I'm not going to be eating a whole lot more just because there's nothing to support with all that food. I'm just not working out that hard. Frederico, it's good to see you as always, saying, hey, Matt, uh, good to hear uh, you now. Good. Yeah. Sorry about the audio issues earlier, folks. Uh, how calorie hacking can affect our recovery? Oh, good question. So when we are hacking, there's several ways we can do this. The first and easiest way is you just purposely eat a lot less food for a given period of time. And you can do this a number of ways. Uh, you can cut your normal Portion sizes, if you have normal diet that you have of how much you're eating, just cut it in half. Uh, you can fast, aka skipping meals is a, another way to do it. Uh, you can also, I usually recommend people start looking at uh, liquid sources of calories. So if you're a drinker, <clears throat> you know, for alcohol, you know, try and go with as little alcohol as possible for a month or so. That's usually one of the more uh, popular sources of calorie hacking where people will have you know dry November 
or something where they don't drink any alcohol. But that goes for all calorie sources that are liquid as well. Juices, sodas, you know, that smoothie that you get at the health bar at the local fitness club. Yeah, that's still like 900 calories there in a cup. You know, that's a meal that you're ingesting at the end of your workout. So basically, if it has calories, try not to drink it for uh, a while. See what happens there. And when you are recovering from your training and your workouts, if you really need a lot more food in order to recover, your body's probably going to ask for it by increasing your appetite. But in all honesty, in, in my experience, most people just don't exercise enough or that hard to really warrant the need for a lot more food. You know, I always like to tell the story. There was a guy who used to work at one of the gyms uh, way back in the day, and he would, no joke, be in the gym three hours. And the entire time he was there with his phone like this, just talking. I have no idea what in the world he was talking about. Like, how in the world do you talk on your phone for three straight hours? about anything to anyone. And it was every workout. It wasn't like once in a while. He spent the entire workout on his phone. And if you caught him at the right time, you might see him put it down and do one set of tricep extensions on the cable machine and then pick up the phone and talk for another 20 minutes. And at the end of the workout, he would always come up to the desk and he's like, yeah, I'll take two muscle milks. And he'll down both muscle milks at you know in one shot. When sitting here, I'm like, why? Like, dude, I literally burned more calories and put more of a demand on my body cleaning the treadmills than you just did working out. And I'm not going to come back here and be like, yeah, I need to drink all these protein shakes because I clean the treadmills. It's a weird thing that we humans do when it comes to exercise and working out. You know, back in the day when I was uh, big on my Taekwondo classes, and I still practice, but I used to think, okay, I've got to eat something to really fuel up for my Taekwondo class. And then I'd come home from Taekwondo and I'm like, okay, now I need to eat something afterwards to help me recover. And looking back, I was like, I really wasn't doing that much activity in those classes because they were an hour long. And sometimes it'd just be, we'd have a warm up for about 10 minutes or so. And then we'd have some stretching in the middle of the class. And sometimes the instructor would be like, okay, I'm going to give you a, a lecture on uh, how to free spar properly. So we're just standing around and sitting around. So honestly, in that hour, I was probably only really physically active to a modest level for 20 minutes, if that. But I thought in my mind, oh, I'm working out. I need to eat more because I'm working out. But the funny thing is, during that summer, I had one of my first real jobs, which was washing cars at this uh, uh, car dealership. And this was soap, bucket, and hose work. So I was crouching down and moving my body around. And that was nine straight hours in the hot summer sun doing moderately physical labor for nine hours straight. And I would come to work with a little sack lunch and like a little sandwich and a granola bar. And that was it. And I wasn't thinking to myself, I should be eating a lot of good food because I'm literally physically active for nine solid hours here but it wasn't a workout. So I didn't think I needed it anymore. And it's no wonder that at the end of the day, I'd come home absolutely starving and ravenous and feel like I need to eat three pints of Ben and Jerry's, which I really did one time. But when we think of it's a workout that it needs something in addition to that. And the, the fact of the matter is usually it doesn't, you know, we're really not expending that much more. My usual general rule of thumb is any physical activity that's an hour or less doesn't require nutritional information. Typically, if you're getting solid square meals a day, maybe a snack and you're eating to satisfy your hunger and stuff, you typically don't need any special nutritional information or intervention for activities that are an hour or less. If I'm going for a bike ride and I know it's going to be a good three hours or so, yeah, I'm going to pack some granola bars and maybe some Gatorade or something like that, to, especially in the hot summer days here in Colorado. But yeah, an hour or less, you probably don't need much as far as food goes. But if your body does want it and does need it, it'll last for it. It'll say, I'm still hungry. And you say, okay, great. I'm going to go make you a sandwich. A couple more here. Ben, Ben, hey, didn't know uh, you speak French, Matt. <laughs> Good evening from France. <laughs> no, I never took French. I've been to France twice in my life. Wonderful food out there. Love it. Um, oh, thank you, certified. And he's like, I almost forgot to like this video. Thanks, folks. Like, share, subscribe, all that good stuff. I know I'm always terrible about doing that. Calls to action and things in my videos. I'm not the best business YouTuber out there by any stretch, but uh, appreciate the 
the support, guys. So yeah, calorie hacking, just basically drastically dropping the amount of calories you're consuming for a period of time. It could be for an afternoon, it could be a day, it could be a week. But generally, you know, a couple of weeks is about where I tell people like maybe not quite so long because you don't want your body to, to totally adapt to the new uh, lower level of caloric intake. Plus, you're going to notice you, you're, you're getting tired, you're lethargic, you might be compromising your workouts, might be compromising recovery a little bit in that regard. So if it's really doing that, then keep your hacks shorter or less severe. But one of the benefits of calorie hacking is that you don't necessarily need to count anything because it's obvious you're eating a lot less. You know, sometimes when people are trying to lose weight, they're trying to really chip away at their weight. They're trying to split hairs where they'd be like, oh, you know, I went out and got my usual sandwich, but instead of American cheese, I put on Amer uh, cheddar cheese. And I heard that cheddar cheese has 7.6 calories less per pound, you know, or whatever, one or two grams of fat less, or, you know, instead of this beverage, which has 30 calories, I got this beverage, which has 10 calories. And it, like, okay, you can chip away at it and stuff, but it's much more effective because calorie counting and understanding how much you're really eating and how much you're really burning is definitely an imprecise science. When people say it's like, well, I was in a 180 calorie deficit for today. I'm like, there's no way you're that accurate. There's no, I mean, people can be in a calorie balance and think they were in a, a 1200 calorie deficit. We can be off substantially in both directions. So if you had, you know, 2000 calories you consumed, and it was really 2500 calories, and you thought you uh, burned 3000 calories, and it was really only 2500 calories, you now have a 1000 calorie delta between your perception and what you actually did. And that's when people are like, well, I'm, I'm sure I'm doing enough to lose weight and you're not, and then it's really hard to nail down. So with calorie hacking, you want to make an adjustment to your diet or your caloric intake or expenditure that's big enough that you're like, wow, okay, that is definitely very different from my normal. That is a lot less than I normally eat. And you can also do it through expenditure too. You know, expenditure can make a big difference. I know a lot of people, they poo-poo the idea of burning calories, like you can't out train a bad diet and all that kind of nonsense. But I've certainly done it myself. I've certainly been able to drop weight not by changing anything about diet, but by really being more physically active. And sometimes the best ways to do this is to just simply have a lot more exercise on a daily basis. Because when it comes to burning calories, by far the biggest variable and how much you're burning is simply time. You know, if you are working out, let's say Monday, Wednesday, Friday, in the gym, lifting weights three times a week, Okay, and how, how much are you really burning when you're lifting weights, especially if you're spending half the time scrolling on your phone or talking on your phone like that one gentleman? You know, how much are you actually physically active during that hour versus if you said, okay, I'm going to go for a light jog for 40 minutes every single day this week? You know, that's going to be adding up. That's a decent amount of calorie burn by the end of the week. And because it's continuous, and because it's at a higher level of pace of caloric expenditure, that's gonna be something that's gonna add up and keep your diet in check. You know, try not to eat to compensate, which I'll get into in a second here, but you can do it through expenditure. You can, it usually is more time and effort intensive, which is why a lot of people will say just eat less instead of exercising more or being more physically active, but you can do it being more physically active. It certainly can be done. And uh, it's not the most practical for everybody, but it's an option. You can do it. Uh, Super Prime 117 coming on when saying, uh, when improving power in sports, I often hear a coach uh, mention formula mass times acceleration. Yep, usually squared equals power. If true, then does max strength or overcoming ISOs that don't give much hypertrophy or speed improve power? Yeah, because ultimately, remember, your muscles don't know how to generate power. They only know how to generate tension. And they generate tension by recruiting muscle fibers or technically motor units at a faster rate of speed. This is why strength makes you faster. It's not physically moving fast because physiologically, 
the way muscle works is when you contract a muscle, you're not actually contracting the whole muscle. If you did that, you'd rip it right off of the bone. And if you ever get a really painful cramp, that's what happens when most of your muscle fibers or, or motor units are recruited. That's what happens when you've got that much tension in your muscle. So the way muscles work is when you contract a muscle, you've got a motor unit is a neuron with associated muscle fibers. And when the signal reaches the neuron, all of the muscle fibers associated with that neuron fully contract. As they call it the all or nothing principle. Muscle fibers are either relaxed or they're contracted, relaxed or contracted. So the difference in how much tension you're generating the muscle depends on the rate at which you are recruiting those motor units. So when you are generating more tension or strength, you're recruiting them at a faster rate of speed. And when you move faster, you're doing the exact same thing. You're recruiting motor units at a faster rate of speed. So strength and speed are actually fundamentally, as far as your muscle fiber recruitment goes, exactly the same thing. That's why generating a lot of tension through any means, isometrics, heavy strength training or whatnot, can develop power because it's doing the same thing. That's how that works. You don't actually physically need to move fast. You just need to generate your motor units at a faster rate, which is why you have so much more tension in the muscle. And that's, that's the basic fundamentals of why strength training makes you faster, how a power tempo makes you faster uh, and because it makes you stronger. Because when you move faster, you're generating more tension, which is just faster recruitment. Because remember, everything in fitness is about speed. Everything in fitness is about speed. No matter what the goal is, no matter what you're trying to do, I'm changing this about my workout, I'm changing this about my diet, I'm changing this about you know, my, my programming and whatnot, all you're ever doing is changing speed of how often or quickly you're doing something. Calorie hacking is no different. When you hack and have a caloric expenditure or a caloric intake go down, you're slowing down your rate of calorie intake. You know, I was, burn, I was consuming 2,500 calories a day. Now I'm down to 1,700 calories a day. You're slowing down your rate of caloric intake. Well, I was working out once a week. Now I'm working out in some way, shape, or form most every day. You're speeding up your rate of caloric expenditure. Because everything in fitness is about speed. Everything is about speed. You take what you're normally doing as you're speeding it up or you're slowing it down. You're never doing anything new or different or unique because fundamentally that's how everything in fitness works. Everything you need to have happen when it comes to everything in fitness is already happening. You know, protein synthesis, burning fat, cellular turnover, all of this stuff that you hear out in our fitness culture saying you need to make this thing happen, it's always happening. All you're doing when changing diet and exercise is changing the speed at which it's happening. You're making things happen faster or slower. Oops, excuse me. All right there. So back to calorie hacking. Let's talk practical application a little bit here. How can you do this? Well, you can do this creatively however you, you prefer. Basically, what you're doing is you're just saying, I'm going to eat much less or expend a lot more, or you can even try a little combination of the two for a given period of time. And you can freestyle this too. You can do it intuitively. You can say, okay, I'm going to eat, you know, instead of three meals a day, I'm going to have two meals a day. And you just keep the, the, what I eat and everything the same. I'm just going to skip breakfast. I'm going to skip dinner or whatever, you know, feels right for you. You can do this any way that you want. And you can say, I'm going to try it for two days. Great. Awesome. See how it goes. Oh man, after the end of that two day, I was so tired and sluggish and I was just craving everything. Okay, maybe one day. But if you're like, boy, after two days, I felt amazing. This felt great and felt really easy. Okay, maybe try three, maybe try four. Oh man, I really don't like skipping a meal. Okay, try having, you know, two meals of the day are eating much less than normal. You know, basically just find a creative way to eat a whole lot less is what you're trying to do. And if you have that mindset of how can I eat a lot less for a tolerable period of time, you're going to find the answer that you need for what's going to work best for you. Because ultimately, when it comes to losing weight, managing your weight, that's really the bottom line is how do we get to the point where we can consume a lot less and not go insane <laughs> and not be so hungry that all we can think about is food. 
not feel so deprived that all we can think about is eating a cupcake, that it's not affecting our energy levels. So we're slow and sluggish and we can barely get through a workout. We want to have as big of a caloric dent, either in expenditure or intake as possible with as little negative repercussions on mind, body, and lifestyle as possible. And it's going to take some trial and error. It's going to take some experimentation, but you'll learn what's going to work best for you. And once you do, it's going to make a very big difference in how you can strategically implement this throughout your life. And then you're in control. You get to know when you can hack, when you can have those increases in your expenditure or your intake and what works best for you. And when you do that, you're going to have, quote, that whole weight thing taken care of that you don't need to worry about it so much anymore. And the more you get good at it too, the less you're gonna even need it to begin with because you'll just generally take off the weight. You're gonna to get to a point where you're at a happy weight that you can manage without much stress on mind, body, and lifestyle. And then you can then turn to diet and exercise to fulfill other needs rather than weight management. And it's a very good place to be. It's a much better place to be. It's a healthier place to be by far. So don't feel like, oh, I can, you know, be healthy and fit and strong once I lose the weight. No, prioritize training for the sake of strength and power and fun and go and do the things that you like to do for the sake of doing the things, not just because they burn calories. Have a healthy diet because it satisfies you. It satisfies you and it feels good to eat those certain foods and not worrying about what types of foods are going to help me burn fat or store fat or any of that stuff. You don't need to worry about that thing. When you are looking at your hacks, that's when you're just, okay, I'll use this hack for a couple of weeks. And then you chip away and you hack off the weight over time. And that's how you get it taken care of. So thank you everybody for coming on in. Apologies again for the audio issues. Initially, uh, I will definitely make sure that doesn't happen in the future. But uh, thanks everybody for asking questions. Again, like shares and subscribes and all that for the support of the channel, all of the books in the RDP library, including the Kindle and the PDF version of my book, Calorie Hacking, are down below in the description, and uh, the support is very much appreciated. I will talk to you folks next time, and I hope you have a great weekend. Till then, be fit and live free.